I'm Chris Metzger. I'll be moderating up here in a lonely place up here. I, I will be joined by John Eat in a moment. He's on an important phone call. Our moderator, or excuse me, our panelists are right down here in front so they can see the screen and that we'll make this as interactive and fun as we can. So this is a, a good session on aorta illac disease, a lot of case-based uh, presentations and discussions, and we will try to have some panel discussion, but also uh, if there are questions, we're going to throw this out to the audience and have some fun uh, with it. So welcome. Without further ado, it's a pleasure to introduce a good friend, a leader in our field, Herb Arano, uh, who's going to talk to us about supervised exercise program and medical therapy for our aorta illac disease, and we need that perspective before we hear all the case base. So, Herb. Chris, thanks. Um, I love this uh, setup. This is, this is great. I'm gonna move around a little bit. So, uh, yeah, as Chris said, my task is to talk about supervised exercise and medical therapy for aortoiliac disease. Probably one of the lighter topics this morning. My uh, disclosures are here. So, I'm gonna review a case with you. This is a 48-year-old who has a year history of left calf claudication on walking one block. He's an active smoker, he's got hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, and coronary disease. He had a drug-eluting stent placed in his LED two years ago for an NSTEMI, and he's got preserved left ventricular systolic function by transthoracic echo. At the time that I see him, he's free of cardiac symptoms. Uh, his uh, on exam is left common femoral, uh, popliteal, and pedal pulses aren't palpable. Uh, his medical regimen includes aspirin and a statin, a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, and an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, his left uh, ABI is a 0.56. So he undergoes non-invasive vascular testing, uh, and uh, at the time his arterial dopplers and segmental press pressures suggest that he's got left-sided aortoiliac disease. So the clinical challenge, uh, what should this patient's initial management be? Should it be uh, SET or supervised exercise therapy and medical therapy, or should it be revascularization and medical therapy? Well, the guidelines from 2016, these are the most recent iteration that we have. Uh, there are an updated set that are forthcoming. We've been saying that for a while now, but probably due out in early uh, 2024. Uh, so what do they say? Level one recommendation for silostazole, a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, uh, for improving symptoms and increasing walking distance in patients with claudication. So we've got that in our medical therapy armamentarium. But that's pretty much it, right? We don't have any other meds that you can use to uh, reduce claudication. Structured exercise therapy, of which supervised exercise therapy is, is one type, is indicated with a class one recommendation to improve functional status and quality of life and reduce leg symptoms, as you know, uh, and should be considered, should be discussed as a treatment option for claudication before uh, considering revascularization. And then finally, revascularization also carries a class one endovascular revascularization uh, in this example uh, for patients with lifestyle limiting claudication, which this patient had, and hemodynamically significant aortoiliac disease, which of course this patient had as well. What do the data show? Uh, well, there's not a lot of data, actually. There's a lot of data around supervised exercise in general, but for aortoiliac disease, there's just two trials, Clever and Super. Uh, Clever was a, uh, a relatively small trial, prematurely terminated. It had a 12-month primary endpoint. Uh, the data shown here are out to 18 months because that's the longest follow-up that we had from that trial. And you'll notice a couple of things. Uh, number one is that supervised exercise uh, led to greater peak walking time than, uh, than uh, optimal medical therapy, but so did stents. Uh, however, there was no difference between the two. Stents and supervised exercise therapy performed similarly. Claudication onsite, uh, onset time was better in the supervised exercise therapy arm. It wasn't any different with stenting, but again, you'll notice the, uh, you know, the small numbers here uh, at the top of the slide. That may have just been a power issue, but there was no difference between how stenting and how supervised exercise therapy performed. That second trial I mentioned, the super trial, was also randomized. It was a bit larger, though. It looked at the same question, supervised exercise therapy versus, uh, uh, versus endovascular revascularization. And what you'll see is out to 12 months, there wasn't a difference between these two treatment strategies with, when it came to walking uh, distance, maximum walking distance. However, uh, endovascular revascularization did provide greater quality of life on the vascuqual instrument. And, uh, one of the secondary endpoints in the trial was pain-free walking distance. That was longer in patients who underwent endovascular revascularization than uh, optimal medical therapy at 12 months. Uh, that same trial, however, had some limitations. Um, it was stopped early, just like um, Clever was. 
There was poor adherence to supervised exercise therapy, and we may talk about that. That's a real challenge. You can say to your patient, I want you to go do this, but there are a lot of reasons why they can't or won't. Uh, and then, of course, 50% of the structured exercise therapy arm crossed over. They ended up getting revascularization anyway. Uh, so when you think about these trials, uh, an SCT-first strategy would reduce the percent of patients undergoing endovascular revascularization, but it would come at a cost of poor health status and quality of life in some patients. So uh, this was a tale of two iliacs. I don't know if you caught that on the first slide. So the first iliac, the first treatment scenario, patient gets uh, silostazole, 50 milligrams twice daily and is prescribed supervised exercise therapy. Uh, so in this case, it's hospital-based in conjunction with a cardiac rehab program like many of these are. Uh, he's prescribed intermittent walking exercise to moderate to maximum claudication, and he alternates with periods of rest while he's doing that. He's supervised, and uh, he engages in 30 to 45-minute sessions three times weekly for 12 weeks, and then warms up and cools down before he... So that's a pretty standard supervised exercise therapy regimen that he is prescribed, and he completes it, which is not to be taken for granted. The second iliac scenario, the same patient uh, undergoes a CTA uh, because whoever saw him, in this case, let's just say it was me, thought he should go to revascularization. And so, uh, and that led to this invasive angiogram where you can see this uh, common and external iliac artery disease on the left. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on the case because we are going to review a lot of cases in this session, but there was an approach from above uh, to recanalize the left limb and from below for the right, and a balloon expandable stent placed in the osteal uh, left common iliac with an overlapping self-expanding stent uh, into the external iliac on that side. Resolution of the challenge, the clinical challenge. So both iliac treatment scenarios resulted in similar intermediate term outcomes in these patient scenarios. So that happens a lot, even though I showed you some data suggesting that quality of life and some other um, metrics might be better with revascularization. It's not always the case. A lot of people do just fine. So I think it's not unlikely that uh, these patients or this patient in either of these two scenarios may have fared similarly. It may not be, however, that these are mutually exclusive. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that you can combine structured exercise or supervised exercise therapy with an intervention, right? You don't have to do one or the other. And so um, that's exactly what's shown in this network meta-analysis. It's 37 trials, 2,600 patients. And what you can see highlighted in the red circles on the right side here is that maximum walking distance was better with when angioplasty was combined with supervised exercise therapy when compared with best medical therapy. And similarly, that combination was better than supervised exercise therapy alone. So there did appear to be incremental benefit at 12 months uh, when these two were combined rather than by themselves. Here's another network analysis that was a little broader in that it also included home exercise therapy, and it was a little larger, 46 randomized trials, 4,200 patients. You can see the results here. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at the combination of supervised exercise therapy and endovascular revascularization here, you'll see that uh, the benefit is greatest when compared with the individual components of that or other therapies. Same thing was true at one to two years. When you get out beyond two years, however, you start to lose the benefit. Um, and so there is sort of a, a time uh, for which this therapy is, uh, this combination therapy is, uh, is successful. Um, so key learnings from today. If you're clever, there's no difference in peak walking time or claudication onset time at 18 months when we're comparing endovascular revascularization uh, and supervised exercise therapy. If you're super, that was the other trial, endovascular revascularization is associated with better health-related quality of life and pain-free walking time at 12 months. Endo may be superior to SET for symptomatic aortoiliac disease, but randomized control outcomes are mixed. Um, finally, the combination of the two may be superior to either strategy alone, but outcomes beyond two years are similar. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Herb. That's a great talk and a great uh, setup for the rest of the session here, and we need that uh, uh, as, as a basis. Uh, we'll save some questions for you in just a moment because we'll have a panel discussion after the next couple talks. Talking about going to other extremes, we go from the medical therapy uh, to, I think, uh, I have... Uh, is it, are you next, Peter? I, th I think it's, um, uh, I have Yulanka Castro Dominguez uh, listed as, I wish I had sent this aortic occlusion to surgery. So from one extreme to the other, and then we're going to balance it and the rest of it. So please uh, take us to the case yeah, that you the, wanted to do something different. <laughs> Thanks. I got the fun topic. Okay, okay good. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, there you go. Oh, thank you. Okay. 
So this, we'll start with the case. It is a 53-year-old woman, active smoker, with a history of hypertension, obesity, uh, chronic kidney disease, supersented with increasing respin and the left foot and discoloration for about a month. Um, she kept going from different uh, primary care doctors, ED, uh, until uh, she, was, she finally got to us with this increasing uh, symptoms. Uh, these are her PVRs, as we can see, severely, you know, moderate to severely reduced on the left. And if we can appreciate on the CTA, she has a, a left iliac occlusion that extends all the way down to the, uh, goes from the common to the external iliac, but with patency of the distal external iliac, like mid to distal. Okay, so we take her angiogram, given her severe symptoms. Uh, and in this case, we can appreciate, again, that the common is occluded on the left, but there's some reconstitution of the, dist of the external iliac. Um, and given this, given her symptoms, we're really concerned about thrombotic occlusion. Uh, we went ahead and obtained access in the left common uh, and then performed thrombectomy, very, you know, very carefully performed thrombectomy of the common and external as well. And this, for this, we use a CAT7. And as you can see, we're carefully trying to remove clot Multiple, multiple passes. However, in our next picture, still not looking great. So I'm like, okay, and what's the issue? What's the problem? Uh, we did perform IVUS to show there was still significant uh, thrombus at the origin of the common. Uh, therefore, we went ahead and uh, stented this with uh, two um, eight millimeter BBX, one in, the, one in the right iliac and one in the left, because we can see the actual thrombus extend to the distal aorta. It's the reason why we did, definitely needed uh, kissing stents. So our next picture, uh, not looking great. I still don't have the flow that I want on the left. And I see that there's a seizural thrombus on the left, on the external. Probably my concern was some clot that kind of sandwiched down into the, into the external because I didn't see that initially in my iris. So I went ahead and stented the, the external as well. And now I have a you know, pretty good result. There's still some disease in the distal external, but you know, my aorta looks really good, my distal aorta looks really good, both iliacs look really good, uh, but the distal external is still not as good, but I do have good flow down the SFI. My concern was if there's any distal embolization. But you know, she had palpable pulses, her breast pain had resolved, and she was feeling good at that moment, and I was feeling okay at this moment. I'm like, we'll continue monitor, keep her in anticoagulation, let's see how she does. She was doing good that day. However, next day, Decreased beautiful pulses and pain again. I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay, so we take care again for angio. At this moment, I'm like, I'm learning from my issues, review my angiogram. The issue is my outflow. Okay. So I take her actually with brachial axis. This is ultra low contrast in her case uh, because of her chronic kidney disease. Uh, so we take brachial axis, uh, we inject it, and as you can see, I have no flow on my left iliac. Okay, so then we, persum we perform thrombectomy of her left iliac. I think for this, we use Jedi. And again, very carefully from thrombectomy, followed by balloon angioplasty of uh, the common, the external, all the way down to the common femoral. And then, then I get a pretty good result, pretty, really good flow. And we also perform IVUS, showed that it was pretty clean at this moment, and also really good flow down to the SFA, uh, and the common, the profonda, and also with my pressures that have improved as well in follow-up. And she's really doing good, even up to one year of follow-up. Okay, now why do I bring this case? Is that I wish I had sent this one to surgery. And it's all about access in this case, because I feel like my, my issue is mainly my outflow. And it's very different when you can uh, do these cases with an, with an open approach. Uh, and I mean by an open access approach, um, because that, that can actually leverage you from, from a vascular surgery colleagues, that can actually leverage you more and be able to perform more effective thrombectomy. So proper access planning based on treatment areas is key. Open and percussionary access approach depends on the disease extension. And it's important to prepare for the risk of distal embolizations. And IBIS helps with distal size and determine extent of the disease. Any questions? So, yeah, this is a great case for discussion. And rather than go for the panel, let's discuss this while we're here. This is, this is a good case. So a couple questions. Um, what about the presentation? It looked like your first modality on the left was thrombectomy. So maybe I wasn't paying attention enough. Was there something that they had a cute presentation that said this was thrombus? about a month, but new onset symptoms. She never had symptoms before, but it was rest pain and discoloration for a month. A month, that's so, okay. Uh, in, in the I second think this was more of a subacute occlusion. Okay. So the second question, so you got across there, you showed us no flow, and then the next picture we saw were two stents up in the aorta. So the question there was, um, did you stent while there was still no flow, 
there? In other words, and did you try to think, hey, why is there not flow other with Ivis? Did you re-enter the lateral wall of the aorta slightly, which it happens to all of us? Um, Ivis and others and pressure gradients might tell you before, I, I don't like putting a stent when I don't see him flow unless I've confirmed that the problem is a dissection or something. Take us through your thought process, and then I'll see what the panelists think of stenting without flow. Yeah, great question, and really good point, and definitely we did IVIS, so that's why it's so important, and put it and highlight it on my last slide as well. It's so important to perform IVIS to make sure that you're not, <clears throat> you know, you're not in, a, in the dissection plane all the way to the aorta, and IVIS really did confirm, I didn't show in here, but IVIS did confirm that we were true lumen uh, and that we were not in a submintimal space, but it did show a good amount of thrombus that was still residual despite multiple, multiple passes of thrombectomy. So, you know, I think I was, we were dealing either with persistent clot, persistent thrombus, I was at the ostium of the iliac at this moment, or persistently distally. It's the reason why we, did, we did, uh, proceeded with stenting. And did you do runoffs at the end of the case? Yes, yes. Um, and, they, and they were okay? All right. Yeah. All the way down to the foot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, great. And, and, right. and don't show it here, but all the way down to the foot, yes. Perfect. Any other thoughts from the panel? Any other questions you have? Or, yeah, I mean, I definitely would have started with supervised exercise. No, <laughs> no I, I'm kidding, of course. Um, you know, hindsight's always 2020. That was a great case. I mean, I'm sitting here wondering, you know, how else could you have approached this? Um, obviously, you, you started out with a strategy to address the thrombus. Um, was it possible to, once you had come up with a wire and you were in the true lumen and the aorta would have been impossible to come from somewhere else. Could you have come up and over and put some kind of filter, you know, downstream to minimize the risk? Was it worth considering low-dose catheter-directed lytics overnight and bringing them back just to kind of reduce the thrombus burden? So I don't know what other people think about those strategies. Obviously, you never know you're going to get into trouble until you're in trouble, so it's easy to ask those questions after the fact, but curious to know what others are thinking. You know, I think this sort of speaks to the, the, the choice of access. And, you know, we don't like coming from the arm, but if you think you might have to chase down to the common femoral, well, if you've got a sheath in the common femoral, then you're kind of stuck. So, uh, and in the setting of a s iliac CTO, I think many of us feel that the initial strategy should probably be to come from above and go anagrade. And, and certainly, and I'll show you a couple cases here in my talk where we came from above, and, you know, sometimes you can't get through from above and you have to go from below. But the advantage of coming from above is if you do have to treat all the way down to the common femoral or beyond, then at least you don't have a sheath getting in the way. Uh, you have the luxury of doing embolic protection device, thrombectomy, you pretty much keep all of your therapeutic options open. Yeah, I think those are good points, Peter. And, and you can have all three. You can have above and below. The other advantage from above is that you're very unlikely to re-enter the lateral wall of the aorta, which is, you know, it's, a, it's hard to know sometimes. And while we all believe in preserving the bifurcation, I very much, as you'll see in talks in a moment, every now and then when you're doing iliac CTOs from below, you will have to raise the bifurcation a little bit because of where we re-enter in the aorta. And I think it looks like that you did raise the bifurcation a little bit for just uh, that very reason. What do you think, Ivanka, was the ultimate etiology of um, coming back, because it's not very common for all of us to come back the next day, but it happens to all of us as well. What do you think happened that said, man, one day after my nice final result, here I am again when I'm supposed to be in clinic. What do you think happened? Yeah, really painful, absolutely. You know, it's one of those cases, going you know, back to your comment, one of the reasons also we raised the bifurcation is, as you can see in this image, and I was showed it as well, there was thrombus on the, on the, on the left side of the distal aorta as well reason why we also wanted to raise a bifurcation. But, you know, I agree. I think coming from uh, having that, that uh, access from brachial or radial gives you so much, it gives you uh, more opportunities in terms of crossing as well. But in her case, also crossing, it was really smooth. So, you know, it's really, you know, really pointed out as uh, that it was pretty thrombotic. Um, yeah, you know, my thoughts were, I mean, when looking at the images and looking at everything, my, I think the issue was outflow in her case, you know, like often to a distal external. My concern was, I don't know if there was more clot that was sandwiching down, because initially I did not have that um, uh, thrombus in the distal external. Last question, Nick, what do you think, or I'm sorry, go ahead, Ben, I want your comments, and then also, would you have used a covered stent? It doesn't look like it was a covered stent. If you see thrombus, would you use a covered stent? And so let's get a quick poll, and then uh, Ben, your comment, and then we'll move on. So quick poll, how many would use a covered stent there if you saw thrombus? Yeah, you know, 
really, this will be my first line in this case. Uh, I, I, the minute you mess around with thrombus, you're looking at embolization, and even with an embolectomy device, any time you manipulate a thrombotic lesion, expect embolization. Uh, I, I think I'll just have gone right with a with a graft stent and got it done with. And Ben, you had a comment before we go to the next talk. Yeah, just briefly. I think um, <clears throat> on these younger women with aortoiliac disease, um, you know, the, the hair on the back of my neck always kind of stands up a little bit when I'm doing these. I'm always at heightened alert because their arteries are smaller. Uh, I worry about access issues. They're, especially when, you know, you see the scan, is the external open and just underfilled? Or, you know, it was very small on that scan. So is it diseased? Um, or is it underfilled from the common iliac occlusion? So I think um, in, the, in this case, I probably would have had a low threshold to do a cut down and be prepared to potentially do a, a femoral patch extending into the external so that I can stent through that and leave no, you know, basically no undiseased part. And I almost always use covered stents in the iliac system just because I've had some bad uh, ruptures and, you know, I think covered stents work really well in the iliacs. Looks like Jay has, go ahead, Jay, if you got a comment. I was along the same line, it's a very good outcome, Yolanka. And going back to your title, you, the title is, I wish I had to send this patient to surgery. So how do, you, how do you connect your title and your final outcome, and what are you going to do next? Just you know, going, going out to uh, uh, Ben's point, I think having, uh, in terms of access, being able to have a cut down, just, you know, I think it's overall uh, will give you a lot more opportunities to prevent disembolization, to have more control of your thrombus, and actually just be able to c control your outflow a lot more. So I think that's why I chose this case in order to present that, because I think that would have probably, um, you know, be able to resolve everything in one case, in her case. Well, we should move on, Yolanda. You were assigned, hey, send me, you showed me our, the worst, something, I should have done something differently. Nice job with that, thank you. It's the beauty of multidisciplinary approach where all of us think, hey, a cut down is the ultimate distal protection. So, uh, Ben, thanks. All right, next, Peter's already raring to go, as we saw. Uh, that was a great job, you Yeah, nice job. Uh, uh, that was a great and Now case. we're going to talk about an ec uh, iliac perforation. Uh, how do I bail myself out? Please, everybody pay attention uh, I'll, because this will save a life if you do some of these things. It, it happens quickly. So, Peter. Yeah, so, uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, this is perhaps, without a doubt, the most terrifying thing that you can see on an angiogram is a perforation. So the first question, of course, is don't let this happen to you, and why, what, why did this happen? But Hopefully the theme of, of my comments of the next few minutes is gonna be that the best way to treat an iliac perforation is to prevent an iliac perforation. So first thing you need to know are the risk factors for rupture. And of course, CTOs, large bore access, female gender, oversized balloon, high pressure, stiff wires, but calcified arteries are absolutely the number one reason why this happens. And especially at the aortoiliac and common iliac bifurcations. So only you can prevent perforation. So if you use one takeaway message from my talk, it's gonna be use IVL and use IVIS, and hopefully this will prevent you from having that sickening feeling when you saw that first angiogram. So um, IVL has been shown to be very safe and effective in the treatment of iliac disease. This was a paper from the Disrupt 3 PAD registry where the, basically there were no dissections, no perfs, and no incidence of slow flow. So my first tip, uh, is use IVL, it really has been a game changer for the iliacs as well as for other vessels. We now have adequate devices that we can do vessel prep for these larger iliac vessels. The L6 devices are now available uh, in eight, nine, 10, and 12 millimeter balloons. These are three centimeter long balloons, which is really nice, especially when you have a mismatch between your common iliac and your external iliac or between your external iliac and your common femoral. Remember that the eight and nine millimeter devices uh, go through a seven, and then the 10 and 12 millimeter devices go through an eight front sheath. Um, uh, the next thing to consider is in fact what we were just talking about, the use of covered stents. Use of covered stents for task C and D lesions was found to be beneficial in the COBUS trial. But so these really nasty high risk lesions, these uh, task C and D lesions, the bifurcations, these heavily calcified lesions, and CTOs, 
uh, are, are really ones where you should consider the use of covered stents. And in fact, the SVS most recent guideline recommended stent graft in instances of severe calcification at risk for uh, vessel rupture. It is also a class one recommendation from the um, uh, 2020 Sky Guidelines uh, to use uh, covered stents in these scenarios as well. Um, it's very important to know your covered stent and your sheath compatibility. You don't want to be figuring that out when someone's got a blood pressure of 50 because you just ruptured their iliac. Um, but these two devices, I think you absolutely should have immediately available. The 8L and the 11 millimeter devices can be post dilated to 16 millimeters, and that can really be um, life threatening. Uh, the same is true for distal iliac occlusions involving the distal external iliac at the junction with the common femoral. There we like to use self-expanding scents, and similarly you need to know your Viabon and your uh, sheath compatibility. Um, we talked just a few minutes ago about raising the bifurcation, and for straightforward lesions that's fine, but if you have a high-risk bifurcation that's very heavily calcified, this might be an instance where you might consider using a CRAB technique which is a covered endovascular reconstruction of the bifurcation utilizing uh, sort of a top hat and trousers approach where you're putting a stent in the iliac artery and then two uh, balloon expandable stents inside of that. So when you do have that dreaded perforation, there are things you must have immediately available in your lab. And we have something called an aortic emergency kit. And this is what's inside of it. We have occlusion balloons, balloon expandable and self-expanding covered stents, coils, plugs, and the extra support wires and sheaths that are gonna be necessary uh, to be able to carry out all of those life-saving interventions. And this is actually a picture of our, and it says, emergency aorta kit, pretty straightforward. So let me just jump into a case. So this was a patient who was found to have calcific distal aortic and common iliac disease with an SFA CTO. This is actually a patient of Rick's, um, Herb. Uh, one of our uh, uh, community cardiologist uh, uh, patients. Uh, so he brought the patient to the lab, and you can see there was nasty calcification there. And so he was very cautious. He used a five millimeter balloon initially, and then proceeded with kissing VBX stents. Uh, stents were deployed, and then after post dilatation, eight millimeter with eight millimeter balloons. Um, why is this not running? Here we go. Maybe. Anyway, you have to trust me that it showed a pretty nasty perf there at the bifurcation. So when you get an iliac rupture, the first thing to do, don't panic. You're the captain of the ship, staff is gonna take their cue from you, so you've gotta remain calm and be decisive. Reinflate the balloon, obviously, to temporarily tamponade and hemodynamically stabilize the patient. Obviously, you're gonna give lots of volume. Uh, you're gonna pressors while you're, secu and also getting additional uh, venous circula uh, access so that you can volume resuscitate the patient. And this is something that I think we don't uh, talk about enough. When the you know what's hitting the fan, it's important to just point to a particular person and say, Judy, call blood bank, tell them we need four units of blood. Alex, you need to call vascular surgery, tell them we might need their help. As opposed to just everybody just kind of yelling things out while, you know, it, everyone's kind of panicking. You should already have that emergency aorta kit in your room. And then, uh, of course, you also have to remember that you can't just put a coda balloon up in the aorta. You've also got to try to control it from below the level of the perforation because you have transpelvic collaterals that can, that can continue to cause ongoing blood loss. Hopefully you have opened up all of your covered sense at this point and you're gonna very dutifully and, and quickly but uh, carefully uh, put in your uh, covered stents. Again, a CRAB technique if you're talking about the aortoiliac bifurcation. Alternatively, if you have an Endologix AFX graft, that's a, a graft that sits on the bifurcation, that can be uh, very helpful. Um, and then, of course, an aorta uni device and then sending them for a fem fem bypass is another option as well. Obviously, we want to try to avoid the hypogastric, especially if the patient has a history of an occluded IM. Uh, IMA to avoid the potential for distal colon ischemia. And uh, I like to use Viabonds for the more distal occlusions. And remember, make sure you take a Viabon that's large enough. So we typically recommend about two millimeters oversizing to accommodate for the ruptured segment. So um, he placed two more additional stents. There was still 
uh, some contrast extravasation, but then after post dilatation with a larger balloon, he was able to successfully um, uh, take care of the situation. The patient got transfused six units, but uh, made it out of the hospital with a little bit of a, a type 2 MI. So second case, 52-year-old woman smoker uh, who comes in with uh, left iliac occlusion. And again, she did have this like little nubbin, as you can see here, so we uh, specifically chose to come from above. Initially went with the front runner, we were able to get into the hypogastric, pulled back a little bit, and then tried to get through the occlusion using a, uh, a glide wire. So at that point, since we had failed from above, we came retrograde, and we were able to get through retrograde with a combination of a glide, got into the true aorta, pre-dilated with a small balloon. So far, so good. We put a balloon expandable stent for, pre for precision at the ostium of the common iliac artery, followed by external iliac uh, artery stents. Looking pretty good, but after we hit open it all up, we saw, oh my god, here's this perforation from a branch in the hypogastric. Now that probably was something that happened when we were initially trying to get through from above, but then once we opened up the inflow, then it suddenly sort of became apparent. Now, the question is, what are you gonna do about this? Well, you know, first instinct might be to place a covered stent across the hypogastric. Potential downside to that is you may get buttock or leg claudication, colon ischemia if they don't have an IMA. You won't be able to prevent back bleeding from transpelvic collaterals. You lose the ability to control bleeding at the source. And well, you could consider a vascular plug, but there are a lot of the same issues there as well. And while you certainly could go to the OR, I think Ben will probably back me up on this, these are kind of a bloody mess, and, and digging into someone's pelvis while they're acutely bleeding is no bueno, no fun for the surgeon. Not something you like try to do. Now fortunately, she was hemodynamically stable, so we said, all right, let's, uh, let's see if we can try to bail ourselves out of this. And in fact, what we did was we ended up putting in um, a couple of coils here, and we were able to successfully resolve the problem. And fortunately, you know, we didn't have to cover over the, the hypogastric as well, and we were able to get out of Dodge. So my third case, uh, one of our non-invasive uh, colleagues who, who still does caths, uh, tried to do a cath on one of his patients from the right radial. There was a loop, so he had to then go to the left groin. Unfortunately, not someone who was a big believer in ultrasound guided access with a micropuncture kit and just the old-fashioned way, just kind of, you know, poking and hoping with a POTS needle. And at some point he said, you know, I may have hit something on the way in, but I couldn't pass the wire. So he asked one of our uh, other interventional attendings to help him, who did use ultrasound guided access, was able to get in. They did the diagnostic cath, which showed that he had triple vessel disease. Um, and during that transition phase, the patient was complaining of some pain there and had transiently dropped her pressure and um, that responded well to fluids. And then he took an angiogram, which showed this, and you can clearly see that there's tenting of the bladder from this big bleed, and that there's bleeding from the inferior epigastric. So what did the interventional cardiologist do? He said, well, let's just quickly fix the circ in, in LAD. <laughs> yeah, I, I had the same reaction. Uh, so now he's done, and then he calls me because the patient's in shock and complaining of severe pain. Uh, so I was like, thanks for this, and it was the classic, I was down the street uh, in clinic and then I had to, you know, run up. So we came up and over with a seven French sheath, uh, took care of that with an eight millimeter, with an eight millimeter viabond, we were able to perforate the seal. She went home, the, uh, the, uh, the occlusion, she went home the next day. So my takeaway message is most perforations are in fact preventable. By careful pre-op assessment, look at the CAT scan, use IVIS, and then liberal use of both IVIS and IVL I think can prevent a lot of these things from happening. Strongly consider the use of covered stents, even if you have treated with IVL, and be prepared for perforations. You must have an aortic emergency kit in your lab. And when you have a downtime and it's a slow day, that's a great time to practice these scenarios with your cath lab staff, to just so, so that they're ready and trained and in the moment when these uh, disasters do strike. Thanks very much. Great, thanks, Peter. I'm surprised your interventional cardiologist didn't put an impella in at that point, but I'm kidding. Um, so we don't have a lot of time for panel, but I do want to ask one thing here. So I'm with you, external iliacs, nitinol, cover sense, 
internal relaxant, actually inferior epigastric often coils are the way to go. The question is at the, cro or at the aortic elect bifurcation. Those, you can do CRAB, but sometimes there's still a gutter, there's a leak and so on. I would submit, and I want to ask the surgery or opinion as well, if you're going to do, fix something at the aortic elect bifurcation, I think the, what you mentioned, the AFX2, shorty 40, if you, you got, we, that's in part of our emergency kit as well. Uh, because I think you work pr predictably seal every part of the aortic iliac bifurcation. If you don't have that, so f question one, do you use the AFX2 in that setting? And if you don't have that or don't know how to use it, aren't facile with it, I want to get a surgical opinion if there's a perforation at the aortic iliac bifurcation, what are some other options? So first AFX2, then surgeons, if there's not a, if you try to crisscross and you don't seal it, which by the way is a risk, and you don't have AFX2, then what? Anyone take that? Uh, that's a scary situation uh, that happened to me very recently, actually. So um, <clears throat> it's a, that's probably the worst place to get a perforation is the aortic bifurcation. Difficult to manage uh, with endovascular techniques um, because, uh, you know, we'll, we will occasionally uh, intentionally rupture the bifurcation during EVAR to make room for limbs, but in that scenario, you're confident that you're sealed above and below. Uh, in treating occlusive disease, your intention is not to get a watertight seal necessarily. So there's going to be, you know, flow between kissing stents. Um, even if you're raising, you know, extending, trying to get everything as sealed as possible, um, you can get back bleeding from the hypo up into the aortic bifurcation. Um, so uh, I have, uh, my case recently, I could not get control endovascular. I had to open and do, basically, I had to ligate everything around the aortic bifurcation and do an aortobiothem. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I just make a comment because I have to grab a microphone. Um, that's a pretty rare situation. That yep. with an iliac rupture, that you can't get hemostasis. When, when, I know that when we push our fellows, the most important thing is to remember, reinflate the balloon. And I tell you, I haven't given board exams for years. The first thing that people will say, you, you, you do your follow-up angiogram, you see extravasation, they say, get a covered stent. That's not the first step. The first step is to put your finger on the bleeder and make it stop. That means reinflate the balloon. Once the balloon is inflated and you've stopped the bleeding, now you have time to think. Correct. Think about the sequence. Am I going to stick the other side? Am I going to put an aortic balloon? How am I going to get control of this? Because I've seen situations where we had a ruptured iliac, and the pressure really does drop to 30. I mean, it's, some people really bleed fast. Some people don't. And so what you really want is stop the bleeding, then think. And it's a great opportunity to call your senior partner, call a surgeon, get a bunch of people around while you've got hemostasis, because once you've got your finger on it, now you can think and figure out what to do. Reinflating the balloon, I would say at least three out of four percent, of the, three or four out of times, is going to stop the bleeding when you let the balloon back down, and you won't have to necessarily put in a covered stent. And bifurcation sort of bleeding at the aortoiliac bifurcation, again, very, very rare. I mean, I'm sorry you had to deal with it, but it's very rare and almost always fixed with covered with kissing stents. The, uh, it, I mean, I'm sure it's great to have an AFX just hanging around. We don't, you know, they're about, what, $12,000 for this thing, and hopefully it's going to fit your bifurcation. Yeah. So it's, There's a shorty 40, the smallest one, yeah. is what we use and have it, and we do have it in the room, but you're right. So everything you said is spot on. A couple things, like you said, first thing, stop the bleeding. Second, relax, as you said, captain the ship. But the third thing, I don't care how calm you are as the captain, it's always nice to have a senior partner that you trust because they're coming in while your catecholamines are jacked. You know you just caused a perf. That person's coming in fresh with an objective set of eyes and not nearly as adrenaline. So I think, John, your point is very, very The other good. thing that we usually do is, uh, if I have any questions, there's a lot of, particularly if you have a big rock in the iliac where it looks like it's a big eccentric piece of plaque that you just can't imagine that you haven't just pushed it right through the wall when you inflate a balloon, is... Uh, to just leave the balloon in place and do your initial injection immediately just to make sure. Do I have extrav? Don't take the balloon off the wire because you're talking about it can actually be a significant amount of time. So I'll almost always do an immediate just kind of flush injection 
Why are my balloons sitting there so I'm not having to go, wait, give us that balloon back. Oh, we dropped the wire. We did something else. And you've lost your opportunity for immediate and quick hemostasis. And I think that other point of putting an aortic occlusion balloon up helps, but it won't stop bleeding. There's the other half of your body that's bleeding back toward you. So there's a lot of collateral. So really, unless you're actually tamponading the actual perforation, you may not uh, cover the bleeder. I will tell you, we had one that, uh, we had an intern with us, and it was, we were trying to do a kind of crack and pave to put an EVAR in, in an occluded iliac, and we had a Viabon, a VBX in, and we blew it up, and I had the intern blow it up. I said, don't worry, just take it up to 12 atmospheres, whatever, and sure as hell, the damn thing ruptured. I said, how can, we had extravasation with a Viabon in the external iliac. So we thought we must have cracked it proximal or distal to our Viabon. So we extended proximally and distally. Shot more retrograde, still had extravasation. I, I, I just couldn't figure it out. So we did a retroperitoneal cut down, and in fact, the VBX had split. The calcium had torn the VBX, and I couldn't get my head around the idea that I was inside a covered stent but still had extravasation. So even though it's a, quote, covered stent, they're not impermeable. You can tear a covered stent. So keep that in the back of your head, that these things, while they're pretty darn durable, they're not absolutely not breakable. But, good, good point. Yeah. Well, while you're all warmed up with a microphone, John, I'm going to invite you to give the talk well, here. So I, I don't know how this got on the, ske on the schedule, but we're not talking. This has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, aortoiliac disease. He said, well, it was aorta. He said, show that thing with the malperfu malperfusion. So this is... This is like a timeout from what we've been doing. We're going to talk about dissections. If some of you are going to treat dissections, because in some of your hospitals, you're going to be the primary interventionalist. Uh, you know, IR has kind of drifted out of this in a lot of hospitals. And so you may be the uh, cardiac surgeon's pal when it comes to treating dissections. And uh, I mean, I don't know I, if, whether it's really true, but it feels like uh, aortic dissection is... is our most common aortic procedure now. It seems like we do way more dissections than we ever do aneurysms. So it's, it is an increasing uh, disease, and you might get called because of malperfusion. So by, what do I mean by malperfusion? So somebody has a type A dissection. I assume everybody's sort of semi-familiar with the concept. You've got to tear somewhere in, uh, distal to the sinotubular junction, somewhere in the ascending aorta, but many of these extend all the way around to the aortic bifurcation. And somewhere in that process, you clip off perfusion to something, the brain and extremity and the viscera. And what do you do about that? Well, generally speaking, if you have significant malperfusion, um, you go ahead and fix the primary disease. That is type A dissection, A equals always. So the cardiac surgery goes straight to the operating room. They open the ascending aorta. They put in a, a short graft usually, fix the primary tear. And if you're then redirecting most of the blood back into the true lumen, it fixes the malperfusion. But in some settings, the malperfusion is so severe that you can't uh, or the cardiac surgeons are nervous about going straight to the operating room for a type A. Generally speaking, type A goes straight to the operating room. But if you had, for instance, uh, one of the more common scenarios would be uh, severe extremity uh, ischemia. So you've got a leg that's got no pulse, and they can't move it, and they may have some sensory deficit, and the lactate might be up a little bit, and you really put them in the category of, you know, severe extremity ischemia that won't, that that limb won't survive if you take the four or five hours it's going to take to go do cardiac surgery and cardiopulmonary bypass and, and uh, circa rest. And so what do you do for that? Pretty common scenario. I don't know if this thing will go forward one more. So... Let me see if this one right here. So the case I want to show, for, so if the extremity case, generally speaking, you would do some kind of fenestration would be the most common thing. That is, come in from the groin, try to cross the septum somewhere, uh, see if you could get a, a stent in an iliac, or you send them to vascular surgery, and we would do a fem-fem bypass, just a remote extra-anatomic bypass, and get blood supply to the leg. This, this case I'm going to show you is a little bit unusual in that it was a guy who came in with a type A and while he was being evaluated showed signs of a left hemisphere stroke. So he winds up with a right hemiparesis, uh, some speech deficit, and a, and a left hemisphere stroke. 
You can see this CAT scan, I'll just run through here slowly. And I'm particularly interested in these arch vessels. We, we just skipped over actually a finding, but I'm not gonna, we'll go back and I'll show you. So you can see the ascending is dilated. You got essentially a circumferential dissection up there. And then you can see the dissection head down through the visceral arteries. I'll just let that run for a second. So basically, nothing else happens here. Let's see if we can get to here. So I want you to watch the arch vessels. I'm going to kind of go through this. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but that thing in the middle is the left common carotid artery, and there's not supposed to be that little black line in the middle of it. You see, there's a little flap with essentially functional occlusion of the left common carotid artery. And you've got a hemisphere that's got poor blood supply, and you have a cardiac surgeon that says, well, I'm not going to haul this guy off for cardiac surgery because this guy's got a stroke, and now I'm going to reperfuse the brain, and he's going to get a hemorrhagic stroke, and he's going to die on the table, and my statistics are going to be bad, and therefore we're not going to do the type A repair. Is there something intermediate that you can do? I thought this was sort of interesting. We had him do one of these perfusion scans, and... I don't know enough about this. I'm going to show you this version of it because it kind of, I can sort of make sense out of it. The purple part is basically the dead brain and the green part is kind of the ischemic penumbra. And the interpretation of this from our neurointerventional people was there's not really very much dead brain. So there's still significant brain to protect. If you had the whole hemisphere dead, you'd say, well, we can't protect anything, so there's no real reason to delay. But in this setting, the thought was, well, it's actually not as big a stroke as, as you would have guessed clinically. And so we had quite a little debate about it and what to do. Anybody, can you, I mean, again, this is a little bit off topic this morning, but what would you do at this point? Metzger, if they called you, what would you do? I would call you and have a good dissection, a discussion about the dissection. Uh, boy, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking along with you here, but you've got to get that brain involved in this. You've got a penumbra that's there. So mortality to be damned, we got to do something. Uh, yeah. And so you, we could work together and fenestrate into the left common carotid artery. It go. looks like it's a pretty uh, brief dissection, and you could fenestrate and bring something down into the arch from the common either from the neck or from the groin, uh, either way with an axis. But we've got to save that as part of our plan. Okay, so I think that that's the logic here is, you know, it's not a good scenario, but do you have a chance by trying to reperfuse the brain just like you would any other malperfused organ before you do cardiac surgery? Will you have a better outcome? The thought, so you have two approaches. This one would be come from the carotid going down. The other is come from the leg coming up. Either way, you've got to put IVIS in to find out, that prove that you're in the true lumen. We found it was actually going to be easier to come from below. So once you got in the true lumen, you can sort of work your way up with a soft wire on the tip of your IVIS so that you continue into the true lumen. If you get into the false lumen, you just back up, kind of turn a little bit and work your way so that you prove you're in true lumen all the way. Get into the common carotid, and in fact... Uh, this kind of just shows that you can see on the left side the initial catheterization, and that's a stent that's basically kind of a bridging stent. It doesn't have to be perfect. You're basically just trying to get the true lumen in the aorta connected to the true lumen in the common carotid artery. And this actually worked out pretty well. This was the pulse oximetry. This is a gizmo that they put on the skin of the forehead, but it's a kind of a, an indirect way to measure cerebral blood flow. And it was 29 before the stent opened up. And literally within 30 seconds, this pulse ox thing just jumped up on the left side of the head. Uh, clinic, then he went on to cardiac surgery the next day, and they found the entry tear down at the sinotubular junction, put in a graft, and, and uh, he didn't, uh, that resolved his sort of immediate clinical problem. He did not wind up with a hemorrhagic stroke, did improve, still had some hemiparesis, but survived the operation and is now going to be followed for the, the residual type B where he doesn't have malperfusion. Uh, that's that. Let me see if there's one other thing I was going to show you. So here's another dissection. And this is uh, down in the visceral segment. The true lumen is just that little black arc sitting next to the SMA. And essentially all this shows you, this is the worst case scenario is the people that come in with mesenteric ischemia. So type A, 
tender abdomen, elevated lactate, probably got bowel that's on the verge of dying. If you go straight to cardiac surgery with this person, they won't survive because the bowel will die during the operation. They'll have a very high mortality. So you have to try to do something to improve visceral blood supply. The two easiest things here would be either do some kind of, again, a fenestration. So you take either some kind of transeptal needle or some other method where you can get some piece of your catheters in the true lumen, other half in the false lumen, and figure out a way to connect those, either with a balloon or a wire or somehow rip a hole so you're perfusing both lumens with equal pressure. <clears throat> or some people do actually put a T-var in proximally, even with what's called a petticoat, so the bare metal uh, thoracic aortic graft, so that you're sort of redirecting some flow into the visceral arteries to try to correct the lactate before doing the type A dissection. But anyway, I do think it's, again, the, the reason to talk about this this morning with the sort of aortic cases is you may be involved in dissections, and it's a very common problem. And having some tools to figure out should these people, again, go straight to cardiac surgery or are there situations where you need to intervene before the type A repair, either for brain perfusion, visceral perfusion, or extremity perfusion, may be a, a situation that you'll run into. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. As somebody who loves carotid stenting, it's great to see your gizmo monometer showing proof of what carotid stenting does from 29 to 69. That's great. Um, that's a great case. All right, um, let's move on to our next hawk, Dr. Yoshi Mitsu Soga. Dr. Soga is going to talk to us about a uh, step to step approach in crossing aortic occlusions, including the role of IVUS. So, Dr. Soga. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I came uh, from Japan uh, today. I'd like to talk about uh, uh, this is a previous presentation, maybe, but it's okay. Uh, I got to do that. I have nothing to stress. Uh, before talking about topics, uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, clinical outcome of the bare nitinal stent in both iliac and the fan pop lesion. Uh, the result of iliac after the bell nitinal stent uh, is excellent, up to 10 years for longer term result is promising. However, uh, for the fan pop lesion, is is not justified uh, with the bell nitinal stent treatment because high risk of the wrist analysis. Uh, so today, uh, I'd like to talk about the il iliac part a uh, 73 year old male who had an intermittent claudication due to the high aortic occlusion. I, uh, after the uh, guide wire passage, I pulled the bare nitinal stent, smart stent, to cover the whole lesion like that. Here, here is the initial result. Uh, the very uh, tiny uh, stent undilated, uh, as you can see, but it's okay because one month later, uh, bare self-expandable stent has been gradually expanding and put, put together to make a big aorta. The five year later, 10 year later, uh, no listenosis was occurred. So in my opinion, for iliac lesion, for aortic lesion, uh, uh, the complete revascularization or, or, or so complete visual revascularization is, is not uh, necessary. So 50% residual stenosis is acceptable because it's okay to reduce the symptom to eliminate the symptom. Uh, therefore, the important thing for iliac lesion is to put the stent uh, without the major complication. That, that's all, I think. Uh, the recently, uh, in Japan, the transradial intervention has been widespread. It's popular in Japan as well. So also, I, I do the transradial intervention for iliac arteries uh, like that. 73-year-old male who had an intimate claudication due to the uh, left external iliac artery occlusion. Uh, initially, I insert the cis uh, from the uh, left radial artery. Uh, initially, I break that fibrous gap by using the end of the uh, teruma wire then I insert the microcatheter 
the furthermore, I advanced the guide wire with a knock wire technique. The, fortunately, I uh, succeeded to cross the uh, guide wire. And then, uh, after the balloon dilatation, I pulled the stand to cover the whole region. That, that's it. There's some part, the residual stenosis, more residual stenosis was existing, but it's okay. That, that's important. Yeah, right there. Now, he, here is uh, the uh, result. A good result was found that. The issue we noted that, so after the immediately patient get uh, walk up and get back to his ward by himself, it's very easy. So the, the, for me, as well as for nurses, comedicers, uh, their work is very re reduced the, because he can do, uh, he can go to the toilet by himself, and he can do everything by himself. It's easy to manage the patient after the transurator intervention. The next topic is uh, IVERS. The, uh, the, as you can see, the endovascular procedure uh, in Japan, uh, driven by interventional cardiologist, 80% of endovascular procedure was performed by interventional cardiologist like me. Uh, that they are very familiar with the OM4 inch guide wires. They will be very familiar with the IVERS. The role of IVERS is a various like that. Uh, the after the guide wire passage, we have to check the everything. The, the after the balloon angioplasty, we check the optimal or not optimal, so need to pull the stand or not. The, so finally, we make a decision of the, uh, to finish the procedure or not. And here is a plaque type uh, from the iris, the slumbers, the fibers, couch fat. If you can find the a slumbers plaque, uh, it's it's not easy to remove the big slumbers, uh, therefore, so I pull the stent uh, to make a small hole. The, if you can find the fibrous plaque, uh, the pre-dilatation is very important fully, then I, I use the balloon dilatation, then I pull the stent to make an optimal uh, result. The finally, the, this is a very, uh, challenging the heavy couch file lesion. Uh, so we do not have the uh, IVL or something, it's just just putting a stand, the coverage stand, VBX, uh, like that. The in summary, the long-term patency is a primary bare nitrogen stand is a promising. The TLI and the iris is a useful and helpful to our procedure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Dr. Soga, as I get down trying to do this without breaking an old hip, uh, I want to ask you one question here. Um, you showed us some great cases, and, and a guy walking out right after in his gown, that was uh, amazing. The question in there, when you have these long occlusions in the aorta and both iliacs, is there a point, how important is it to stay in the lumen? You showed us knuckle techniques and tack techniques. Is there any point that your IVUS or the progression of the case says, this is too submedimal, this is too bad, and we should not do it today. What guides you along the way in terms of staying in the lumen? How far can you go as long as you're in from one end to the other end? Is that okay? Or is there something that would say we should reconsider? Uh, well, for, for me, uh, the bidirectional approach, it, uh, it's important to, uh, as an additional option. Uh, the, usually, anterior approach is the first strategy for me, but if failed uh, by checking the iris, uh, I do not hesitate to use the retrograde puncture. And then I, I check the risk of the, like rupture or something. Well, I think your co-panelists and audience are impressed with the cases and those results, and especially with somebody with his house, hospital ga gown flapping on his way out of the lab. Uh, very, very, very nice work. All right. Uh, let's pull my slides up if you can. You had the question of which one. Let's answer it. Do you think it makes any difference in the iliac whether you're transluminal or whether you're subluminal? I personally think... I 
I, I would say stay true luminal as best you can, quite honestly. I think it's more physiologic, uh, but uh, you know, for sake of time, I'll, I'll say you, we, we'll call it a tie. <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll, uh, since we're running a little behind, we'll skip some of the panel and incorporate it into the last uh, one. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, and talk about uh, calcified uh, iliac lesions. Here are my disclosures. Well, these are higher-risk lesions, and we have to treat these patients differently. They have higher risk of dissection, perforation, and distal embolization, especially in the external iliac, as we've already heard. Um, and I think that uh, we should use calcium-specific strategies, a lot of IVL for me in the iliacs and the aorta, and a lot of covered stents as needed. Even with IVL, if it's heavily eccentric, it won't always dilate completely, and you need to incorporate that into your strategy as you go forward through the case. Um, so for these kind of cases, I think it's important for people to be well prepared, uh, both them and their family, and you and your staff for a potentially longer case with the, some of the bailout equipment we've already heard about. Um, we use bigger sheaths and more of them, often three, sometimes uh, usually at least two, um, and we don't want to propagate dissections in calcified vessels. Uh, you know, and we access the good leg first, do good angiograms, reassess, and then go forward. Um, we'll often need to pre-dilate in calcium, even if you're using IVL to facilitate the IVL. Then we reassess after the pre-dilatation. We incorporate IVUS a lot as needed, especially if there's questions along the way. I use a lot of IVL in these reasons or in these lesions. Why? You get a bigger lumen safely. Okay. Uh, start and let the IVL do the work, not the balloon, and then work up as you can with in combination with IVL. I want to say one thing to uh, jump on what Peter's already said. Please, for external iliacs, we do this. I'm old. I got gray in the mustache. Every time I do an iliac, when we, what we do is we have the, um, over on the board, we say, here's what I want. This is the viable one I want. It's the wire that goes with this. Here's the sheath size we have, all right? And here's what we're going to have it ready right there. And here's what we're going to do if we have a problem. Then I pre-dial it. When I let the balloon down, leave the balloon right there. Everybody in the room looks at the pressure monitor and everybody looks at your angiogram, okay? If there's a problem, the balloon's right there, you reinflate it and then you open those boxes you just talked about and it's easy. If you take that balloon out, take the picture, and then they're bleeding like crazy as you said down to 30 millimeters, that's a bad thing. If you do that every time, I promise somebody will have a life saved along your career. Uh, um, all right, let's go through some cases. Um, heavily calcified, uh, you can see the aorta in the iliac. And so uh, here's a 7 by 60 IVL balloon. And this is boring. This is what happens every time. You get a nice lumen with no dissection. Now we have bigger balloons. This is back in the day. Um, and so then a uh, covered stent. You can see the distal end. You keep it above the hypo, the proximal end of the aorta bifurcation. And put it in. I'm sorry. Let's see if I can go back and nice result, okay? Uh, next case, again, you can see the little microchannels and heavy calcium. There's stuff in the aorta, don't touch that. There was no gradient, it's a bad band, that's not causing problems, but you can see the common iliac disease. So again, IVL on the left, you see the better results on the left. Now, same IVL balloon on the right. Now you've got nice lumen, now it's easy. Uh, and now we simply uh, create and pr try to preserve the bifurcation. There's a covered stent preserving the bifurcation, distal end above the hypo, so look at both ends. Put those up, preserve the bifurcation, and here we go, preserving all bifurcations and a nice durable result. As we've heard before, facilitating access is a good thing. So this is somebody who had calcified, you see the left main, osteal circ, the right was occluded, you know, and they had low EF and they had uh, heart failure. Um, they also didn't have an axillary uh, option either. And so here's the right common iliac artery and the left common femoral artery, okay? I needed two sheets because we needed to do eight French for the bifurcation left main strategy. So just like with the EVAR, TVAR, and all the other things we do, you can facilitate this with shockwave. Now we have bigger balloons, but this was an older case. But the right common iliac artery shockwave up and around, left common femoral artery shockwave. Now we can get a sheath in on the right for the impeller and an eight French sheath in on the left. And here's nice rotoblader into the left main uh, LAD and into the CERC. And really a nice result in the left main and the LAD and CERC, facilitated by access help with the IVL. 
Um, here's a 90-year-old great guy I followed for years for other things. He had now critical ischemia. He had terrible bifurcation, um, and it was calcified. So we did IVL up and around and then swallowed that IVL balloon with the curved ansel so that we could get to that right stuff over there. And then, again, you can see the bifurcation stuff, the profundas involved, uh, the SFA and common femoral You can see the terrible flow on the right. So two wires, shockwave in the SFA. You see improved results, profundas worse. Don't worry, surgeons, we're not going to leave it like that. Uh, so shockwave in the profunda, and then more aggressive shockwave, common femoral artery into the SFA, and nice final results. You see the improvement in the flow and nice bifurcation. And again, nine years old, that's what we needed to do, just get the flow back. Here's a bilateral iliac disease uh, with uh, little microchannels. I mentioned that with microchannels, I really like an 014 wire here, so it's a command ES. And you can see on this one over here, that's a perfect example of a microchannel in the left common iliac artery. Those are beautifully amenable to wiring with the 014. It's the only time I use the iliac, but for microchannels, I really like an 014 wire. Predilatation to get your IVL balloon, and you can see the IVL on the left from the aorta. See the nice result. Same predilatation and same IVL balloon on the right. You get nice flow, and now we can preserve the bifurcation with covered kissing uh, iliacs, uh, VBXs, uh, 11 millimeters, and nice final result. Last case, uh, this was somebody literally referred to me from a pedicure salon. I mean, they went in with an ugly foot to get their toenails done. The owner knew me, said, I know somebody I think can help your feet. And so that's a, a, a true story, true, true story. Um, and you see access vascular ultrasound. I just put that in there just to say it helps you get around calcium chunks if you're dealing with calcium. All right, so here's Miss Toenail. I mean, this is just flat nasty, and she, uh, she has a lot of comorbidities, but you can see the right common iliac artery and the aorta, which is calcified and occluded. Um, you can see how calcified the aorta is, and we gently probed this and got through to the true lumen. I almost wished I wouldn't, but I did. Um, and so here is an angiogram. You can see the disease in the distal aorta, the right common iliac, the left common iliac is out, and the IMA was important. You can see we want to preserve it. It has some disease as well. It's giving collateral to the other mesenterics. So lots of IVUS to help what we needed to do, lots of IVL from the aorta down to the iliac, and then reassess. Now, if you look here, you, we want to preserve the IMA. I had the IVUS that said we had a landing zone just below that. And we can use a marker to say, how long can I get from the IMA to the bifurcation, okay? And so based on that, that's a 29 millimeter covered stent graft between the IMA and the bifurcation. And there it is up on the road map and with stickers and such. And there's your, you can see the bottom end of it above the calcified bifurcation. Okay, so now we've got the aorta secured. Got more work to do, obviously. So now, because there was a little dissection in the right common iliac artery, this is a non-covered stent. We wanted to leave an option and obviously not cover the left common iliac artery, so this is a non-covered stent from the bifurcation. And here, nice result, IMA open, right common, and that was enough for that day. She, her right leg felt great. She went back to the salon. They said, hey, your left leg's still hurting, go back. Uh, it's a little embellishment she was planning to come back, but uh, so here's part two. You see the left common iliac. I really, we knew she had left subclavian disease. I wanted to go retrograde. So here's the usual two axis, trying to go retrograde. You see all that calcium, I couldn't do it. Uh, so we, there's that, I, what I wanted to avoid, but we had to go from the left arm. Um, there's, and Mike Jolly, that's from uh, the brachial, not from the radial. Uh, but uh, anyhow, that's uh, up there. We ballooned the um, uh, subclavian and then crossed with triple axis. Uh, from above, let me see if I can get make that thing play again. Hmm. Well, somehow the movies are not playing anymore, but anyhow, you get the idea. We externalized the wire from above. Uh, here's the IVL. Huh. Balloon expandable stent. We matched that, and for some reason, the movies aren't playing, but I'll just movie it for you. It looked a good, nice, good result. Uh, so if, in conclusion, with heavy calcium, I think you can treat them, <clears throat> but it really takes a modified calcified, uh, calcium specific approach with careful planning, careful technique, and with so uh, I think you can uh, do that. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention.
Could you uh, tell me how far up do you intend, uh, when you're doing kissing stints, how, how do you decide how far up to the aorta to go, and, and what's the, what guides you? Yeah, so good, good question, and it's a, 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 right into a, a spot that's near to my heart. I think if at all possible, preserve the bifurcation for crying out loud. You know, in, the only reason to raise the bifurcation is if you, in so doing, you can't preserve it. So every now and then, as we talked about with Yolanka's case, if you have to go in the aorta, and you balloon, 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 there's no flow, and you ivus, and it's up there, then you have to raise it, and then you match them as best you can. I think crisscross just drives me nuts when people put these big old, okay, I'm not, I don't care where it lands, and crisscross, you can do it once in a while, but why? It's not physiologic, and it now takes off any contralateral axis in the future. You know, the, one of the points that I, I, would, I was thinking about in this is, and having opened the aorta and taken out kissing stents on a number of occasions, I think what, you, what, what I try to avoid is I will try to put a kissing stent or at least a common iliac stent just at the origin so it's not extending into the aorta or extend it substantially into the aorta. What you don't want to do is have the two stents sitting like that so the orifice of the covered stent is up against the wall. Because when you look down, there's, there's really, even though it opens up, it's very constricted flow into that stent. You're almost better getting where the channels can be parallel. Now, they will always cross, right. but at least high enough where they're starting to be parallel so that the lumen actually opens up instead of these things sitting up against the wall like that. Okay. And I'm not sure that there's any you know, data to support it, yeah. right. but I think it's probably true that if you're going to raise the bifurcation, go ahead and raise it sufficiently that you're getting parallel, you know, graphs. Okay. The other uh, thing... Go ahead and speak, use your microphone now that you're not using your hands. Your, uh, the other thing on your slides, when you have distal aorta with a occlusion, the primary collateral pathway to the legs is the, the IMA. So the IMA looks like this giant terminal branch of the aorta. And it, intuitively, you would say, I need to preserve this. But in reality, if you're going to fix the aortoiliac disease, I'm not sure that, I, I know you've made a point not covering it, and I, I'm not saying it's a good idea to get rid of it intentionally, but if you, if you did have to cover it and you lose the IMA, as long as you preserve one hypogastric, the surgical rule has always been for sigmoid ischemia, if you can have one pulsatile vessel, either the IMA or either hypogastric, the sigmoid generally will be safe because your fear is sigmoid ischemia if you take out, if you had both, both hypogastrics and then you took out an IMA, the sigmoid would be in some jeopardy. Right. But generally speaking, in this case, I would worry if you lost it, if you got an ideal uh, outcome in the aortoiliacs. I, I agree. And the, the, what I didn't show you there was you saw the flow that was going up. These, they gave important collaterals. Her SMA was out. Yeah. And so for that reason, and we didn't need to cover it. So if I could avoid it, that would. So Chris, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> the angio always underestimate the vessel size, you know, when you compare it to IVIS. So when we are using all our data on, on the IVL is angio based. So are we, are we under sizing really our, you know, IVL, ca uh, you know, balloons? And if we do IVIS, what type of sizing do you use? For the angio, we do 1.1 to 1. What about the IVIS? It's, it's a good question. I think... It depends on what you're trying to do, and again, everything's risk-benefit ratio. Before, when we only had sevens or eights, it didn't matter because that's as big as you had. Now that we have eights and tens and twelves, it's a more relevant question. I think one, at least one to one, and we all do this little. I'm going to do shockwave, but it's just like rota. If you do a 1.25 rota blader burr, doesn't do much. If you do a four millimeter shockwave in a 70 vessel, you're not using the technology. So at least one to one. I wouldn't go super aggressive with picking your biggest line on the IVUS and necessarily go aggressively to that. And it's all relative to how frail the patient is and so on. So good question. So go ahead, uh, Jake. Chris, I'm really impressed with the cases that you have shown. I mean, outrageously impressive cases. I just have a question. Are there any cases that you look at and you say, wow, this cannot be done endo. We've got to do a surgery. What, what are the anatomic yeah. features? No, that would. It's a great, first of all, thank you for the nice comments. Um, I think everything, we should all not look, and that's where Ben's comment earlier, there are a lot of things we, you know, there are some things that just aren't good for endo. 
and if they're not good for endo, they're not good for endo, and we should have surgical opinions, or a hybrid procedure. There are some common femoral artery that are so ugly, and I need to incorporate, we need to incorporate that into the strategy. Have my, I've got six surgeons in a group. Have them join me. They'll do the cut down, we do the endo together, and we have fun together. So I think your point is very good, just like uh, Dr. Soga had some great cases, but it's, and sometimes the case will tell you as you're going along. It's not going like I want. I'm dissected. You know, I haven't hurt the person yet. So let me stop and not even put the yet in there. Say, ma'am or sir, I couldn't do this. I promise I tried. It wasn't for lack of trying. But for you, there is a better technique. But I think it's all about what's the patient, you know, how, you know, comorbidities, all those kind of things. That's a great point. And it's the beauty of a multidisciplinary collaboration. You know, so. Well, we better move on here. Uh, so Nick uh, Shamas is going to talk to us about aorta iliac reentry uh, devices. So I'll give you both a clicker. Uh, you can you clicker. Much. Thanks. All right. I think this topic has been hammered so many times. It's going to be a lot of repetition here. So uh, let's go over this. These are my uh, disclosures. So let's take one case: 52-year-old male, right lower extremity resting pain, Rutherford Becker uh, four, uh, non-palpable pulses dependent tuber, you know, on the right. He's a smoker, has never had any type of coronary disease, at least that we know of, and has been previously managed conservatively. He's a Rutherford Becker III, but has been doing reasonably okay uh, till something has changed and he presented to us. So let's see if this plays. Ah, it's not playing. Okay. Well, it's supposed to be playing. So the results are Right above, here you see the CTA of the abdomen showed uh, some distal aortic disease. It's not terrible. Total occlusion of the left common iliac artery, diffuse external iliac artery disease, and a thrombotic disease in the right common iliac artery. And if you look at the angio part, you know, the angio part shows the interluminal filling defect in the right common iliac artery. You can see a flush occlusion in the left common iliac artery, and nothing really fills all the way to the left common femoral artery. The CT, however, showed us that there is a microchannel, you know, in the external iliac artery. So we all what we did is take the pigtail catheter a little bit higher in the aorta, and by re-injecting the dye, you can see all these collaterals and all the way down. Sorry about that. You can go back. Here you go. All the way down here, you could start seeing the common femoral artery filling. And in fact, this is a magnified image for it. And eventually accessing this, you could see it was patent, you know, which in a way start to change the way you're going to approach the care of this patient. In my uh, practice, CTA is really a must when it comes to aortoiliac disease. You know, almost every single patient of mine will have this. I don't think ultrasound is very optimal for this territory. You know, using a CTA will help you uh, a lot, planning your uh, procedure, knowing exactly uh, what you need to do and what type of disease, you know, you're facing. So in my mind, you know, vessel sizing that we just mentioned, the severity of the calcium, the tortuosity, the location and the length of the occlusions, uh, presence of prior treatment, the cap morphology can all be assessed, which help you in mapping the planning approach, you know, and access the tools that you need to have uh, and planning for complications. So this is a task D lesion in this patient. You know, it's bilateral diffuse uh, disease. Uh, and uh, obviously, there was a, a long occlusion. You know, ideally, you know, when, when you ask yourself, when am I going to do here? Well, we know this is task D lesion. Is it surgery versus endovascular? Well, you know, in the, the typical uh, presentation, normally the C and D lesions are considered surgical uh, lesions. You know, we always ask our uh, surgeon, uh, have a team approach, you know, to look into those uh, before we decide what we need to do. A and B lesions are usually have excellent outcome, you know, with the endovascular approach. So in this case, we have a, a more complicated patient who've had multiple radiation treatment to the abdomen and pelvis. He had uh, colon cancer. You know, he's had a cystectomy. He has, uh, you know, a, an ileostomy as well as a colostomy. So we know the, the abdomen and the pelvis is going to be pretty hostile, uh, not to mention that he's a smoker with some COPD, and he clearly did not want any type of, uh, you know, um, uh, surgical approach to treatment. So before we proceed, you know, it's very important to know your sheath, you know, the balloons, the wires, and the stents. 
Uh, one thing is make sure the patient is not on warfarin or type of DOAX before you go into these procedures. Avoid clearly uh, low molecular weight heparin and Andromax during these procedures. Uh, be very familiar with the intravascular ultrasound that helps you in wire position, vessel sizing, plaque morphology, stent expansion. I think this has already been hammered and mentioned many times. Lithoplasty, like Chris mentioned, is, is really your good friend for those severe calcified disease. No atherectomy in the iliac territory. I would avoid this as much as possible. Pain is an indicator of possible imminent rupture. I know John was mentioning what is, what, how do we know if we go subintimal? You know, where do we stop? I keep the patient lightly sedated. You know, I want them to scream on me if I get pain because the minute they get pain, I know there is going to be trouble. So that's one way to know how deep you are into the subintimal space and how much you need to avoid dilation there. The, pain com the patient complains of pain, probably you want to be changing your strategy. Know your covered stents very well and make sure you have them, you know, all, you know, on the shelf. I think Peter mentioned that very much in details. Uh, not to repeat, the Viabon stent is a, is a good stent to have. Of course, you know, the VBX stent is probably the best to have. With the 8L and the 11 can be expanded all the way to 16 millimeter. You can have the live stream, you know, takes you up to 11 or 12 at most. The wire, the approach for me, uh, you know, I, I know I've heard so many different versions of how you approach those lesions. I personally go with the smaller wires and, and hydrophilic wire, as much as people, you know, are, are worried about the potential perforations and so forth. I start with the small wire first, obviously not the astero first, but I start with the hydrophilic wire to see if I can find microchannels, and they go uh, gradually and slowly go into a higher gram tip wire. I try to stay intraluminal. Many times you have those severe calcification, you don't have much of a choice, you have to do go to a high gram tip wire. Go from the 014 to the 018, and of course when things start to fail, you know, the 035, you know, uh, extra stiff glide wire is a good wire. The key, however, is the, uh, the wire loop. You want to keep that wire loop as uh, small as possible. Don't enlarge it too much because if that happens, you could end up with a large subintimal flap that may be very difficult to recross back into the true lumen. Again, uh, always make sure that you are interluminal with the use of IVIS. You know, I find this extremely important. Every single case I do will have an IVIS uh, built into it. Uh, use your CT knowledge. That can help you a lot, as we have seen in this case. It tells you exactly where your lesion starts and ends. So the angiogram may very well underestimate, you know, your lesion length and where it starts, where it ends. So use that knowledge of the CT. Uh, and again, uh, as I said, know your covered stents very well. This is already covered uh, by uh, Peter, you know, the type of uh, stenting option. I'm not going to go over that again. Just watch for perforations. You know, these are big. You know, already Chris covered that very nicely. Thrombotic occlusions, uh, you know, and, and we had the first case. Uh, I typically use a lot more covered stents on those. Unless, you know, they are very acute, then I will use an embolectomy first. Typically, you know, fresh thrombus is easy to remove. When you start having chronic thrombus, it's really very difficult, you know, to take out with uh, just embolectomy or, um, you know, using some of our, uh, you know, um, uh, embolectomy devices. So I prefer to just uh, treat them with covered stents. Uh, you gotta watch, of course, make sure the stent is long enough, you know, when you have plaque shifting that you're still covering this really nicely. And of course, distal embolization, you have to check for this every single time. Uh, DSA to the foot is very important. You know, embolization happens and it can be dramatic in those cases. The, looking at our case using the CTOP classification, you can see that uh, the distal cap, we had a flush occlusion, of course, in the common iliac, but the distal cap looked favorable for a retrograde approach, which actually we uh, ended up using. After fixing the right common iliac with covered stents and fixing the right external iliac artery, uh, going in with a crossing catheter and an 014 wire, uh, you know, we were able to cross uh, directly. This was lucky and good, but many times you don't get that lucky. You know, one uh, thing that uh, uh, I use is the tip of the pigtail catheter. You know, you can see, for instance, in this case, which is different from the, from the one I just presented, the wire is going intra, um, you know, uh, subintimal. And if I can put the tip of that pigtail catheter right in that proximal, you know, cap, I can find a way to redirect my wire toward the tip of the pigtail catheter. And it just seems to work very well. And in fact, in this case, uh, particular case, it crossed very nicely. 
again, you need to be uh, very much uh, um, uh, understanding the reverse CART and, and the CART uh, procedure. Uh, you know, rendezvous and snaring, you know, can come very handy. Uh, if all fails, you know, we have the ability to uh, use re-entry devices. You know, the Outback uh, can be a very good device to use. I personally like the Pioneer. I'll be able to see the lumen, you know, redirecting the flow at 12 o'clock, and you can see the, uh, you know, needle, you know, right there, uh, and you can essentially uh, insert your needle straight into the lumen under IVIS uh, or under uh, uh, ultrasound guidance. Uh, to me, this is a more reassuring way, you know, when, when I re-enter those uh, vessels. And uh, again, you know, like uh, John was saying, we don't want to uh, raise the uh, bifurcation too high, uh, we have to preserve uh, some of that uh, bifurcation, uh, but sometimes you have to go in, and, and many times I go up to almost a centimeter above uh, in cases where some distal aortic disease is present. Now, if, they don't, if I don't have too much distal aortic disease, I can uh, uh, do exactly what Chris is doing and, and stay away from, uh, you know, raising that bifurcation. So again, plan your procedure, make sure you got all the tools on board, uh, anticipate complications, they will happen. Uh, be prepared to fix them. You know, make sure you have all the supporting catheter, crossing wires that you need. IVIS is a good friend. Know your techniques and make sure you have true lumen reentry devices, either the Pioneer or the Outback. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. I have so, a quick question for you. What fraction of common iliac occlusions do you think you can cross successfully? I would say over 90%. Everybody, does that other so, panelists feel that way? Because so, I, I think there is some, you know, is this dismal or not? I mean, most you can get across, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. If what, you're yeah go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think when you start, it's not so high. And so I will tell you, I think I'm pretty good now. When I started these, like, what the heck? Am I ever going to cross one of these? It, it, you know, I mean, that's, that was a long time ago. But, but it is careful technique. And nowadays, I think 80 to 90%. Uh, at least. And do you, would you do this, uh, does it matter what setting you do this in? In other words, would you do this in a strip mall? Or does this have, or would you do it in a hospital? This is always done in a hospital. Yeah. Does anybody you know, do common iliac occlusions in an OBL, office-based lab? No. I'd be a little nervous, wouldn't I, you? Yes. That's probably not the case to do in an office. I, I agree. Lab. When you have complications, you really need to be ready. You need to, to have the whole setup for and it. And yeah. would you do this in a lab that did not have covered stents available? Nope. Absolutely not. No. And I yeah. have seen some medical legal yeah. cases where people yeah. had, they said, oh, we were doing iliac disease, got a perforation, no covered stent in the yeah. hospital. And I think that's probably of those of you who haven't done a lot of these, those are three things I would think about. Yeah. You should have a pretty high likelihood of getting across, but do it in a hospital and make sure you have yeah. covered. Yeah, these are good points. Great, yep. great points. Thank you. I think for time's sake, uh, we have a perfect cleanup batter here. Dr. Ben Culver is going to talk to us about a hybrid approach to aorta iliac uh, dissections. Uh, so, Ben. Thank you. So, I guess we'll, this is also dealing with occlusive disease, but uh, from a different etiology. So, um, Disclosures. So this is a 57-year-old gentleman who actually says he, he has no medical problems. He feels good. He's a pretty healthy working guy. Um, he presented to my clinic, actually, uh, after being discharged uh, about a month pr uh, prior for a type B dissection that had been managed medically. Um, and then he actually had been... Um, on a, you know, at the big hospital and followed up with me closer to home in the community. Um, and on questioning him, actually, he says that he's been having a lot of pain when he eats um, ever since he left the hospital, and he's actually lost 20 pounds um, since the admission for the type B aortic dissection. Uh, but no, no ongoing chest pain, back pain, just this postprandial pain. <clears throat> so looking at the scan, um, can we... Uh, Will it run the video there? Hey, in the AV team, this is three talks in a row now. The movies aren't playing. Do we have any fix for that because it's important for this talk? Do you have any suggestions for go. us? There we go. So we see a, a type B aortic dissection that's starting right around the left subclavian. And on the, on the image on the right, you can see it, it extends all the way down into the, actually into the external iliac, I believe, on the right side. So um, this is... This was his scan initially, and you can see actually anteriorly the true lumen 
um, is somewhat compressed, but all of the visceral vessels were patent. And this was a scan on presentation. So based on this, he was medically managed. He did well in the hospital. But he didn't receive a, a follow-up scan until he saw me in the clinic. <clears throat> So four weeks later, we can, if you could run through this scan, um, this is what we're dealing with. And this is actually, I had to order the scan when I saw him. So this is, you know, a few days later, I'm looking at this scan, um, thinking about his postprandial pain. You can see the true lumen is very compressed now, different from the scan a month ago. And if we go down into the visceral segment, it totally obliterates. There's no true lumen. And the SMA is thrombosed. So he, it, this is four weeks later, so now in, you know, planning to get him in for surgery, come up with a plan, we're talking about, you know, another week probably to get him in. So we're, we're talking about five to six weeks now of probably having this clot in the SMA because he's been having postprandial pain since he left the hospital. Um, so... So the challenge here is that we have subacute type B aortic dissection with chronic mesenter mesenteric ischemia or subacute mesenteric ischemia, um, an aortic origin of the left vertebral artery with a zone two uh, origin of the dissection, and a SMA occlusion that's now getting into the sort of subacute to chronic phase. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, it, what's the John, maybe you can uh, give some insight. Like, what, what, would you, what would your thought be on how to manage this SMA issue? Because he's dissected all the way into the iliacs. It's a big problem because you got kind of a semi-old type B and you don't have very good origin. But, I mean, I think generally speaking, people are going to put the T-bar in, yep. probably cover the supply in. Uh, whether you do a fenestration or a... TBE is some kind of branch device for the subclavian or worry about it later, but basically get arterial inflow. We would probably treat this just as any other acute. Four weeks probably wouldn't affect us too much in terms of whether we would, how aggressive we'd be intraluminally. So we'd probably put a petticoat, that's a bare metal segment through the visceral segment. And we've been pretty aggressive with this, they call it stabilized technique, where you take a balloon back into your thoracic graft and then try to rupture the membrane even through the visceral segment. So you, instead of having a true and a false lumen, you've just created one giant aorta. And at the end of that, if the SMA is still occluded, then you would cross it and whatever. I don't know, I'd probably cross my fingers, maybe I'd put a penumbra out, see if I could yeah. put some clot out if I could. Great, if not, then I'd put a stent in. Okay. Yeah, it was about probably a one to two centimeter proximal occlusion and then reconstituted. And th that's why he was not acutely ischemic and having dead bowel. He was having, you know, postprandial pain was his, his main issue. So he was perfusing his bowel. And, and 20 pound weight loss. The way to do it is to do an SMA thrombectomy and fenestrate the Right. Right, so my plan was to get the true lumen flowing uh, and then see what's, what happens with the SMA. Okay, at that point I have to be, I'm in the hybrid room, so I need to be prepared for a full open SMA revascularization, which is complicated. You can't do an anti-grade bypass from dissected aorta. You can't really do a retrograde bypass very well from a dissected iliacs. So my plan was to try to get the SMA going locally, endovascularly, and if that, did, if that failed, I would do an SMA uh, open thrombectomy and potentially a retrograde stent. Um, so we kind of just talked about that. So I started with a carotid subclavian bypass and a vertebral transposition. Um, actually, I did that uh, um, the following week, and then the week after this, I brought him back to do the aortic uh, portion. Um, IVIS for dissections, I think, is, is pretty much mandatory. Uh, at least I use it for every dissection in, in my practice. Um, you really want to confirm that your wire is running from true lumen to true lumen. 
um, because, you know, I think um, many of us might have seen once in a while that uh, someone comes in or you get called because the T-bar is going from the true to the false, and that's a bad problem. Uh, can be fixed still endovascularly, but um, you want to make sure you avoid that situation. So I started with the, uh, putting the uh, thoracic endograft. I'm still not really seeing good visceral perfusion at that point, so I extended it down with uh, dissection stent, which is bare metal stents. That's almost all the way down to the um, aortic bifurcation. Um, and then using the eight and a half French um, steerable sheath, I was able to get a wire into the SMA. Um, let's see, can you run, well, I guess it doesn't matter too much on the video. So I used the um, suction, seven French suction thrombectomy. Uh, there was some residual, you know, kind of clot uh, in the SMA that I didn't want to continue passing the catheter and risk dissecting it. Um, so I just placed a VBX across that, got really good flow into the uh, superior mesenteric artery. Um, did not have to do any sort of open conversion, although, you know, we had prepped from chest to, to knees, so we were ready to do anything. Um, so I think that's one of the uh, key messages here is to be prepared. If you run the, uh, we got a CTA at one month, um, you can see more on the right. Uh, still some compression, um, but over time I hope that's going to remodel um, and his symptoms resolved, he's feeling good, um, so I'm going to continue monitoring him from that. Yeah, yeah that, that felt good at the end of the day. <laughs> so I think the main takeaway that, that, you know, from this case is that if you're going to medically manage a person with type B aortic dissection, you really have to be meticulous about taking a good history. Um, it's, you know, it, it's easy to send someone home and not catch the fact that they're having pain after they eat because it may not be very severe, but um, I, I would also submit that if you're medically managing type B aortic dissection, you have to get a CT scan before you send them home. So they need to have, obviously they, they get the initial CT scan, which leads you to do medical management based on their symptoms and the scan. But if you're going to let them go home, I think you need to get a, a scan before they go home. Um, because these are dynamic. If you're not getting gated CTAs, you may miss some dynamic uh, obstruction. Um, and then when you're managing complicated type B aortic dissection, you have to be prepared for a lot of different options, including open conversion for uh, perfusing uh, branch vessels. And then with the newer thrombectomy devices, um, getting clot out even, you know, six to eight weeks out is, is possible, which is nice. Thank Great. you. Great job. So uh, we're, we're a little past time. Jay, you were going to make a comment earlier. Did you just want to make a brief comment? Yeah, I just uh, uh, wanted to make a comment. Congratulations, an excellent case. I'm proud to have you as uh, one of my partners. The, I just want to reemphasize the point that you made about getting uh, CT scan before discharge, because that should serve as a baseline against which all the future uh, studies should be compared. And I don't think we should wait. Uh, for 30 days, and I, I was just wondering if this patient had a CT scan before discharge, because the course that you showed is really not a typical natural history of type B dissection. Yeah. I think that follow-up scan that I got in clinic, was we would have seen that three or four days later when he went home from the initial um, uh, dissection care, but he didn't get a scan before he left the hospital. He just had the initial CT scan. His symptoms sort of resolved based on what they were seeing, they didn't necessarily ask him about, you know, postprandial pain or anything like that, so. In your hospital now, what fraction of type Bs do you think are managed medically exclusively? I think probably at least two-thirds th two are yeah, medically if managed. Not more, yeah. About 70, 70, 80 you percent think, are yeah. managed yeah. medically. You know, I would say our, we seem like we're increasingly using these soft indications for TVAR meaning persistent hypertension in the ICU. And what persistent is, is, has evolved from a week of hypertension to three days to now, if they're 12 hours on a calcium channel blocker and they're not controlled, yeah. we often pull the buzzer and say, well, they've got uncontrollable hypertension, A, go to TVAR. Same thing is true for uh, persistent pain. Well, they've still got some interscapular pain for 24 hours, and next thing you know, we're doing TVAR. And I, my impression is that, the, that we've eroded the indications for uh, TVAR in these patients in a 
we're probably, I, I would think, fewer than 50 percent are being managed medically only. So it's amazing. We'll probably have to wrap up here, but it is amazing how the procedures that we like to do, the indications have <laughs> become bigger. <laughs> if it's a long, ugly case, somehow the indications shrink. It's a, it's a medical phenomenon amongst operators. I think with that, we should probably draw this to a close with respect to the, um, uh, I'd like to thank our speakers, our panelists, and the audience, and even the hybrid with the uh, AV team coming in to help on the video running. Um, please don't forget to uh, visit uh, the exhibitors who really do a great job of supporting us, and we've got a great FEM pop session starting in 20 minutes at 1030 sharp. So thank you very much.